Good evening, good evening. Good evening. I tell you what, no matter how I try to fly under the radar at times, I can't. So uh, please understand, I, uh, I am more grateful than you know for you all singing that to me and, and giving me this card in the magnet and Kevin, my plant. Um, it is a blessing to be with you. And I, I'll tell you this, I, I made a comment about this uh, the other day to one of you. I said, you know what's great about the work that I get to do is that uh, I get to see how big the Lord's church is. Sometimes when you uh, only see one congregation, uh, you begin to maybe fall into a concept of this is what the Lord's church is. And the reality is the Lord's church throughout America, it is, it is doing well. I know at times we hear only the negatives, but I want you to know something, that there are brethren up in Michigan uh, that are holding fast to the Word of God. There are brethren down in Florida that are holding fast to the Word of God. I spoke at a youth event in Pennsylvania via the Internet last week. Uh, and I'll tell you that the area up there, I mean, they have their struggles as far as numbers of Christians, but they're doing fine. Uh, I have the privilege and my family has the privilege uh, of seeing how, how connected the Lord's church is. And that's why I tell people, I said, I, you may not have known me before I came here. Some of you did because you shared a meal with me at Tahoe and let me into your camp, right? But here's the deal. We're family. And it's not just family in the sense of, oh, that's a church term, so let's talk about it the churchy way. No, 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 no. I'm not talking churchy terms. I'm talking you and I are blood kin because of the blood of Jesus Christ. You are my family. I am your brother. You know, every family has that one that you don't want to talk about. And maybe I will end up being that one for you. I don't know. But we are related. And that means this, that there's a connection that you didn't know existed before you met me, but it existed even before this meeting. I want you to know that about the Lord's church. I want you to be encouraged about the Lord's church. And tonight, you really have touched my heart to allow me into this congregational family in the way that you celebrated with me. So I, uh, I, I will tell you this, though. The ones who really made the sacrifice, it's not me, it's my family. And uh, a preacher's family is a wonderful thing. A preacher's wife is a wonderful thing. Even when they don't show up, Amen. Right at the service, they still want to go to heaven. Uh, but <laughs> I tried, brother. Got to <laughs> but the idea is this: I want you to pray for Aaron. I want you to pray for Colton and Michaela and Camden and Bennett. And I'm being as serious as I can because they are a part of this ministry. And uh, there are a lot of preachers' kids that never understood why Daddy was gone. And a lot of preachers' kids, and when they look back on memories, they remember mom being there, but not dad. And I have purposed in, in, in what I try to do to include them in every aspect of this ministry. And so normally they're with me. Uh, that fits with the way we choose to school our children and the, the flexibility that we have. They just couldn't come this time. Uh, but Lord willing, there will be other times. And you will get to meet Aaron and the children and, and encourage them. But in the meantime, I'm going to ask for you to pray for them as well. And uh, know that we're praying for you. We're family. And that means, that means more than just we show up and worship together. That means uh, we're connected. Let's go to our Father in prayer. And we're going to jump right into this lesson tonight. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before your throne of grace and mercy tonight, again, we are so grateful to be allowed into your presence. And Lord, I don't know what's happened in the lives of my brothers and sisters today. I, I don't know if it was frustrating. I don't know if it was... Uh, a great day and filled with no stress or maybe just getting here this evening after a long day at work was a, a little bit of a stress. And Lord, I, I know that you understand what we go through in this life. And, and Lord, I pray that uh, for this time that you allow all of us just to take a breath, to relax into this moment of being with our brothers and sisters, to know that that we are amongst people that, that, that want our best and they want us to win in eternity. And we want them to win in eternity. Most importantly, you want us to win in eternity. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to, to gather together over these last few nights and then tonight and tomorrow to discuss the family because, Lord, we know the value you have placed upon the family. Help us to see 
that family is more than just a stop in our day-to-day -day lives. That this is our mission. That as Noah got his family on the ark, Lord, that's our goal. Is to make sure our family is on the ark. I mean, Father, I pray that you be with us as we strive to be who you would have us to be. But, Lord, also be patient. We ask that you not uh, allow your patience to run out. Because, Lord, we got some stuff that we need to work on. And, and most of that is our submissive spirit and will to you. Help us. Help us, Lord, to continue to seek you. Help us to be the light that you would have us to be. Use us if it is your will for your purpose until the time comes that we are called home. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You know the neat thing about family, we talk about it. The neat thing about family that I find quite interesting is that family is made up of a bunch of individuals. And God knows that. You know, you, you talk about family just at a basic level is that even within a congregational setting that, that all of us are not the same. Right? Some of you may want to say amen to that, right? I'm so glad we're not the same. I'm not, I don't want to be like brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, right? But the reality is this. There is a benefit to the diversity in the Lord's church. And I'm not saying diversity of doctrine. I'm saying diversity of personalities. And yes, I will even say diversity of backgrounds. What you come out of and your adventure, your journey to come to obedience to the gospel has helped shape you in a unique way that perhaps my background did not shape me. I, I, I was raised by two faithful parents. My parents had me in Bible classes from the time I could remember. You want to talk about cradle roll? I was in cradle roll. Uh, I, I was a part of, of being at fellowships and understanding the talk about the church from the time that I was born, but I've already heard some of your stories just since being here, and our backgrounds are not the same. Now, here's what I want you to know about me personally. I have always admired someone whose journey that they had to walk took them uh, out of a lifestyle where they didn't know the Lord, and they had to purpose to know the Lord. Amen. You see, I grew up, I, I, I am what is called a link in the chain. We talked the other night at the Maddox house about the importance of generational faithfulness and, and the impact of, of understanding that I, don't, I do not exist on my own, that there were faithful Christians before me and, and I want faithful Christians to be after me. Therefore, I am a link in the chain and I must not break the chain. The chain must not break on my watch. But the reality is some of you are not links in the chain. Some of you are what are called anchor men and anchor women. In other words, the chain started with you. You are the one that is holding fast to the, to the rock. You are the one that started that chain. And I've always looked up and admired an individual's journey that they had to study maybe out of something to come to a knowledge of the truth. But I would tell you this in a family concept that that the Lord's church needs both uh, of those individuals in the Lord's church. The, the body of Christ needs that individual who is the anchor and the individual who is the chain. And here's what I want you to understand is that God made all of us unique and He understands that all of our, our backgrounds are unique. And guess what? Within that uniqueness, that's where He has the concept of family in the Lord's church. Now, I would also offer this to you that the concept of family in the Lord's church is also equivalent in, a, in an application manner to a family concept at home. And, and here's why I, I, I offer that to you is because when I read in the book of Ephesians that there is a, uh, an illustration, a correlation that is made between the way that Christ loved the church and the way the husband loves the wife and the way that the church responds to Christ, the way that the wife responds to the husband, if by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul can utilize that analogy to talk about personal at-home concepts, then I do believe the Bible opens that to us to say, hey, the things that we study are not just to be studied in the context of the church, but also to understand they make application within our lives. In other words, the idea is this. When the Bible reads in the book of Matthew chapter 5, as we discussed the first night, not to be angry with your brother, right? Don't murder, but don't, don't be angry with your brother either. He wasn't saying at home you can be angry with one another and it'd be okay. 
we're going to learn tonight concepts of when he talks about the way we talk to one another. He's not merely saying, hey, in the church, make sure you, you talk this way. But at home, you can talk any way you want because that was only an in the church concept. It's not the way it works. I'm a Christian. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ here in this building. And I am a disciple of Jesus Christ at home. My wife is my wife, but she's also my Christian sister. And my son is my son, but as a baptized believer in Jesus Christ, he is my brother in Christ. And so I must be consistent. You want to talk about the uniqueness of the home and the ideas of what God does in making that illustration of Christ and the church and relating that to the home life. You begin to understand real quick that God really does have a bigger plan and he really does understand that in that diversity, he also expects unity. And in that diversity, he also expects blessing. That's the unique thing about the Lord's church. Is that while we do come from different backgrounds, and your story is a little different than my story, is that at the end of the day, through the body of Christ, that you are to be blessed and I am to be blessed, there's a mutual unity and blessing that occurs. That's why I want you and I to understand tonight that if that blessing is going to occur, not just simply in a congregational context, but also in a family context, then we've got to understand the word transformation. We've got to understand what it is. And what's interesting in the book of Romans, that word will be do not be transformed, right? Or do not conform to this world, but be transformed rather by the renewing of your mind, Romans chapter 12. And the idea behind that is this, that word is where we get our word metamorphosis. That's the, the original word behind that. And the easiest way to explain that would be a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. There's a metamorphosis that occurs when an individual comes out of a world of sin and enters into a covenant relationship with God. The, ca the caterpillar understands that the caterpillar is the caterpillar in the caterpillar state. But when that caterpillar gets into a cocoon and a metamorphosis occurs, it would be silly for the butterfly to live as if it were a caterpillar. In the same sense, a Christian... A disciple of Jesus, one in a covenant relationship with God, must no longer live as if they were not in a covenant relationship with God. That's the concept that's brought out of this text from the book of Ephesians. I want you to turn there. If you have your Bibles, grab your smartphones, your tablets, whatever you may have, and turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to spend, as a matter of fact, we may go out of here one time, but otherwise we're going to be in Ephesians the entire time. I try to make that simple. I, at times, my lessons are flipping the pages to various books of the Bible, but it's also nice just to camp out in a text and, and listen to what that text has to say. But when I look over at Ephesians chapter 4, and I see verses 22 through 24, I, I, I can connect the dots that, that tells me there is something significant that has occurred in my life, and because something significant has occurred in my life, that I cannot live as if it has not happened. I cannot live as I used to live. And that's because in chapter 4, verse 22, the Bible says, and it's in mid-sentence, but I'll pick it up here in a moment. It says that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on... The new self. Now, here's what I did in my text. I circled, lay aside. I circled, be renewed. And I circled, put on. And the reason I did that is because all of those are command concepts. They're command words. In other words, to lay aside, he's not leaving that as an option. He is telling them, this is what you must do. To be renewed is also in the command concept. And what's interesting is that the laying aside and the putting on from verse 24 are in the tense of a point in time. In other words, it happens at a defined point in time. So I lay aside and I put on, much like uh, some of you, you, you get done working in the yard, you're, you're dirty and grimy for me. It's like I just ran through a water hose because I sweat like nobody's business when I work outside. My shirt is drenched. And I come in and Aaron says, you better change your shirt before you sit on my furniture. Right? 
Now, I know what that means. That means she doesn't want the nastiness of what I was wallowing in, right, to get on her furniture. So I go into the bedroom, I take that shirt off, I put another shirt on, and I come out, and then I am not filthy, at least in the shirt, anymore, right? The idea is this, there was a point in time that I laid aside the old garment and I put on the new garment. The Greek word here is a point in time. Now get this though, this is where Bible study is so cool to me when you really get past the surface and get down to it because that phrase in verse 23, be renewed, is not a point in time concept. It is the tense that means this is a continual action for the rest of your life until you die. In other words, you and I are supposed to, even this day, if you've been a Christian for 25, 30, 40 years, you are still supposed to be in the state of being renewed in the spirit of your mind. Because the tense of that word has no ending. Now here's what that all meant. When you really get down to it, here's what that all meant is that there was a concept that the new self was not going to look like the old self. Now, here's what I want you to know about the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is six chapters. Six chapters that can be broken down into two main sections. Chapters 1, 2, and 3. And then there's the division of the book, chapters 3, 4, and 5. So there are basically two sections to the book of Ephesians. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 are laying the case for what is called the one new man. I want you to see this. Look, if you will, back over at chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians. And I want you to notice the idea over in verse... Uh, we'll start with verse 14. I could read the entire chapter, but verses 14 and following will we'll lay the case. Basically, he's pointing out the condition of those who are dead in Christ. Chapter 2, verse 1. He talks about thanks be to God. He talks about Jesus Christ who, who through Jesus, God then allows us to, to have a rebirth, to not be what we used to be. And from a standpoint of the church in Ephesus, you had some of those who were of the Jewish, Jewish faith uh, coming out of the Jewish faith into Christianity. Therefore, in some of their minds, they were always of the covenant people of God. That would have been like those who grew up going to cradle roll. Okay? It's, not the, it's not the Jews' fault that he was born a Jew. It's not the Jews' fault that his mom and dad taught him to follow Judaism any more than it's my fault that my parents took me to cradle roll. I mean, quite honestly, I didn't have a say in that. Neither did the Jewish baby who was raised according to Judaism, right? But I want you to also think about that on the flip side. It was not the Gentiles' fault that the Gentile baby was born a Gentile baby. It wasn't the Gentile baby's fault that the mom and the dad didn't raise the Gentile baby according to Judaism because in the cultural context, that was not necessarily the norm, although we do know there were some Gentiles that would convert over to Judaism. But when you really think about it, what you have in the book of Ephesians in the church at Ephesus, which by the way, if you want to do a really cool study, study about Ephesus from a cultural standpoint. Do you know Ephesus had heating and cooling in some of the houses? It wasn't like you and I have with air conditioners, but you can get online and see the way they cooled water. You, kind of like a swamp cooler. They understood the idea of running air over cold water, and that gives you cold air. You can see some of the archaeological digs. These people, some of them were very wealthy. Anyhow, the idea is this. You had people coming to the Lord's church, coming to faith out of Judaism, and coming to faith out of being a Gentile, their background. And the problem was, as Jews and Gentiles struggled to come to a conclusion that they were all the same in Christ Jesus, the church at Ephesus needs that instruction. That's why when I look down at verse 13, the Bible says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He's talking about Gentiles. For He Himself is our peace, who made both groups, what both groups, Jews and Gentiles, into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. In the temple complex, there was a wall that would be a, a dividing wall. In other words, if you were a Gentile, you could only go this far. 
But if you were a Jew, you could go further than that. And the concept behind this, it's a word picture to say that even in that concept, that, di that dividing wall was destroyed by the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus. Look at verse 15. He tore down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so that, I love so that passages. Why did all of that happen? So that in himself he might make the two into one new man. So you remember what I told you, two divisions of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3. Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6. 1, 2, and 3 deal with the one new man. 4, 5, and 6 deal with how does that one new man live and operate. How does that one new man continue on as different and unified? That's why when you look over it at verse 1 of chapter 4, the Bible reads this way. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore. Some of you, your translations say beseech. Some of your translations say urge. That's because the word that is used there is the strongest word in the Greek language to say, if you really want to know what the author wants, follow what is called the parakolo passages. He says, I want you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. That's why he gets into the idea about verse 2. Humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance for one another in love. Verse 3, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace. That's why you find the seven ones beginning with verse 4. There is one body, one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope for your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. He says you're unified and you're unified in what God has given you and what God has revealed to you. In other words, there's no room for doctrinal differences. You notice how I worded that. I didn't say lack of differences of opinion. Right? Now, here you go. I can say this again. Getting on an airplane is a wonderful thing. There are some people that believe the air conditioner should only be controlled by one person in the congregation. It is my opinion that that is wrong. It should be controlled by the preacher. <laughs> okay, now here, let me, let me go on to something else while I'm on my soapbox. In some places in the South, I don't know if it's that way here, most of the time the air conditioner is set for the ladies. And I understand, you know, body mass has something to do with that, but we won't talk about that, it's too personal. But sometimes also age can play into temperature. And am I cold? And am I not cold? But typically we will set the temperature for our ladies. And then down south, I don't know if it's that way here, but down south the norm is the men put on coats and ties and sit in an auditorium that the temperature is not set for a person wearing a coat and a tie. Here's what I think we should do. Let's let ladies wear the jackets and then set the temperature for the ladies or for the men. I got an amen. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now, here's my deal. Is that doctrine? No, that's called opinion. Even if it comes from the preacher, it's called opinion. And can I bind opinion as doctrine? Shake your head like this. Can you bind opinion as doctrine? Shake your head like this. That's why I say there is no room for diversity in doctrine. In other words, when he lays forth, there is one Lord, one faith, one hope, one baptism. That is not up for debate. But whether or not we set a, a thermostat for the men or the women is up for debate. We need to understand that because sometimes we will allow opinion to be elevated to the position of doctrine. And that ought not be, brethren, no matter if it's on the left or on the right. I've oftentimes said my job, according to what I understand from the Word of God, is neither to be liberal nor conservative. My role is to be biblical. Amen. And that's all I want to be. So in this idea of the second half of the book of Ephesians, what's he doing? He's trying to show them 
That there's a way that the one new man walks. And while you have a variation of backgrounds, you do not get to waver on doctrine. And then over in chapter 4, verse 17, he says this. Look, let's put some legs to this. And the way this works is there's a way that people walk who are not in covenant with God. And then there is a way people walk who are in covenant relationship with God. Verse, four, uh, verse 17 of chapter 4, the Bible says this. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility or uselessness of their mind. And then he goes on to describe what that is. Verse 18, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they having become callous, have given themselves over to every sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. And then he says in verse 20, but you did not learn Christ in this way. Now let me tell you what he basically said. In this second half of the book, you will find the word walk mentioned numerous times. Chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 17. Chapter 5, verse 1. Chapter 5, verse 8. Chapter 5, verse 15. You can find it saturating the second half of the book of Ephesians. That's because it's about what does it look like to live as the one new man. The Gentiles in this text, they had a uselessness of mind. They chose to exist with futility of mind. And the reason is, it's not because they could not have understood. I know there are some individuals that teach in the world today that God has selected winners and losers. And therefore, if you were selected by God to go to hell, to be condemned to hell, it doesn't matter what you do, you are already predetermined to go to hell. And if He predetermines you to go to heaven, then you're predetermined to go to heaven. And they will look at passages like this and say, Aha, see, they were darkened in their understanding. In other words, they couldn't help it. The problem is sometimes individuals cannot know because they choose not to know. And sometimes they don't know just because they've never been exposed to it. But at no point in time has God ever made it impossible for these people not to know. That's why that word ignorance, as it's translated in the New American Standard, there are different Greek words behind the word ignorant. One of those means this, you were just never exposed. If someone came to me today and said, Joe, we want you to build a space rocket, I would say, I am ignorant. I don't know. But if somebody came to me today and said, Joe, we want you to change the spark plugs and the wires on your car, I would say, I'm ignorant. And it would not mean the same thing. You see, because growing up, my father believed it was his job to teach boys how to work on cars. You know what my dad's three boys thought? That it was our job to play sports and be interested in friends and girls. So we didn't spend a lot of time working on cars. Guess what? I'm getting to pay financially for that now. I wish I could go back and learn some of those basic concepts. But the idea is this. I am not ignorant about things of cars because it's out of my realm of possibility of knowing. I am ignorant about things pertaining to automobiles because I chose to be ignorant. Does that make sense? The word that is used here in verse 13, they are darkened uh, because of their ignorance, is the word they were willfully ignorant. In other words, they had a chance to know, but they didn't want to know. So then it in, ended up becoming a calloused heart. You ever developed a callous on your hands? A callous on your feet? People's heart can become calloused. And because they became callous, that resulted in behavior that was trying to be fulfilled by whatever their human passions would, have, would, would seek after. You don't know how that lifestyle happens and how the lifestyle changes. It's not just by dealing with the behavior, it's by dealing with the calloused heart. And it has to start, obviously, with dealing with the ignorance and the uselessness of mind. A person has to want to change. That's what he says. So he says this, look, that's the way the Gentiles walk. But then I want you to understand the way that those who follow Jesus walk. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. The Bible says this, therefore be imitators. There's that word again, right? We already talked about that. That's mimic. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children 
And then in verse 2 it says, And walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave Himself up for us. So what he basically says from chapter 4 verse 17 to chapter 5 verse 1, between those two walk concepts, you think about those as bookends. Well, in the bookends, it kind of frames the material. But then there's all this material between the bookends. He says there's a way the Gentiles walk, and then there's a way that God would have you to walk. And believe it or not, these two aren't close. They are not close. So you can't have one foot over here and one foot over here. The deal is this. You are either all in over here or you are over here. But you can't sort of be in over here. So the question is then what does he want in between? And I would propose this to you tonight. As you and I look at these, the lessons that we will learn that are good enough for the church at Ephesus are also necessary in our families. So number one, I want you to look down, if you will, at verse 25. Because he explicitly says that if I'm not going to walk after the Gentiles, but I'm going to walk after the way God would have me to walk, then I must lay aside falsehood. And I must speak each one of you with his neighbor. Speak truth each one of you with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. You know, I saw something the other day, or I actually heard something the other day as... I was listening to a podcast or listening to a news report and you and I both know everything we hear in the news is true, so this has got to be true. Okay? There was a statement that was made that the average American adult lies six times a day. Six times a day. And in that line, you and I may look at that and say, well, no, Joe, my wife doesn't lie and my husband doesn't lie and and I want you to think about this. It's not that I lie about what I would say are big things, right? If you were to ask me how much I weigh, I would tell you what I want you to know. But that doesn't mean I told you the truth. If someone asked you what size waist you had, you would tell them what you used to wear in the age of 21 because you still think you're there. You wouldn't necessarily say, well, if I wore my pants where I'm supposed to wear them, then my waist would be this. Right? Now, I know, ladies, you do. I'm talking to these men, not you. Okay? I'm talking to the men. But you think about this as well. The things that they said they would lie about would be their health. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. <laughs> You just maybe not have told me everything that you know, but you may think I don't care. So you use the generic term, I'm fine. They lie about their health. They lie about how they spend their money. And sometimes wives and husbands lie about how they spend their money. My, my wife would tell you she used to work at a clothing boutique. Of, that's a fancy word for clothing shop for children. Um, and that women would come in and they would purchase items, but they would write a check above the price of the clothes and get cash back from the, the clerk so that they could have money that their husband would not know that they had because the husband only sees that the check was made out to the clothing thing. And so when the wife was asked, how much money did you spend at the clothing store? If she only spent $75 on clothes, but she wrote a check for $100, she would say, well, it was $100. And you know what he would see at the bank statement? 100. All the while she did that to take money out so her husband wouldn't know. That's called lying. The average adult male in America lies six times a day. And I will tell you this, folks. Do you understand the, the destruction that deceit has? Trust is easy to destroy, is it not? And I've counseled individuals who've come into my office, and I know, Kevin, I'm sure you have over the years, and perhaps others have in this room, where they come in and the husband says, I don't know what her deal is. I mean, the thing that she keeps bringing up, it happened 15 years ago. And there's something there that she needs to deal with. I don't want to make that out in another way, but what he doesn't understand is this. 
Trust takes a lifetime to rebuild. There's a reason that God doesn't want falsehood to be a part of relationships. Because it's destructive. There's a reason that He doesn't want lying to become so common that we just begin to make colors that we assign to the lies. And we say it wasn't a, a big lie, it was a small, and then what we'll say is it was a little white lie. And what we mean by that is this, it was incidental. Now ladies, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor and to do these men in your life a favor. They just heard me say, don't lie. Never ask your husband if the dress makes you look fat. <laughs> because then he's got to be creative with his answer. Right? Now here's the deal. Sometimes we seek answers that we really don't want. And that does put other people in a predicament. Sometimes we've created an environment within our homes that honesty, it's almost scary. Because when someone is honest, the other person will erupt like a volcano. Did you spend, did you spend money today at the convenience store? What did you buy one spouse may say to the other, and the spouse says, well, I bought a Dr. Pepper and a Snicker, to which then the other spouse erupts like a volcano and says, why did you do that? Don't you know that we were going to eat dinner? Why did you do that? And starts reading them the right act. You would say, that never happens. And I would say, you've not met some of the families that I've met. To where either the husband or the wife or the children believe it is safer to lie than to tell the truth and face the wrath of the volcano. You see, what I would offer to you is this. Lying is always wrong regardless of the reason. Amen? Amen. But you and the way you handle knowledge that someone else gives you also must be received in a way that is God-honoring. I've met some environments that were so toxic that they even struggled to be honest when I was in the room. And some of these folks, I'm just going to be real with you, some of these were the men that were cowering because they were afraid the way their wife was going to respond. And we're not talking about admitting to an affair. We're talking about admitting that he spent this much money or that he, on the way home, he stopped at this person's house instead of coming straight home. And when she asked, where did you, know, did you come home after work? He says yes. And then to find out that he went to his buddy's house. I don't know why he didn't say no, I went to my buddy's house. But I can tell you this, based on what I saw, chances are he would have had an earful. What I'm trying to tell you is this. Satan has not gone to sleep when it comes to the way we interact with each other. And God knows this. He doesn't make an excuse for lying. But He also says that, that there's a responsibility one to another that we must understand that also happens on the receiving end. So I've got to move on. But number one, and standard for personal relationship, we cannot have lying and deceit be a part of our homes. And so tonight, I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to challenge you, if you've been lying to your spouse about something, I'm going to give you the freedom tonight to ask for forgiveness. You know what's weird about preaching? Sometimes you have to be given permission. I'm giving you permission to ask for forgiveness. And here's what I want you to know if you're the spouse whose spouse says that they've been lying. I'm giving you permission to respond in a God-honoring way. Will it crush you? Will it hurt you? Yes, let me ask you a question. Do you ever think God has been crushed or hurt? And I'm talking about the impact of our sin on Him. And yet He still loves you. And He still offers forgiveness when repentance is sought. Number two, we must understand that our homes, if we're going to have the families that God would have us to be, that anger and sin must not be a part of that. And we couple that together because in verse 27, the Bible says, Be angry and do not sin. 
Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. You know, I find it quite interesting that when we talk about the concept of anger, that we also have to realize that this is an emotion that mankind has. And God made you an emotional being. He made me an emotional being. And He's not asking that we stop being emotional beings. Some of you wives are saying, you don't know my husband. God forgot that one in His creation. Maybe, I don't know. But the idea is this. Anger is a human emotion. But at no point in time is it ever right to let emotions get out of line with what God would have us to be. That's why there are concepts regarding that the anger of man does not bring about the righteousness of God. It's interesting. I've studied the word anger because um, I, I have a series of lessons that I, I deal with the emotions that the Bible speaks of. And how can we handle our emotions in a way that doesn't step outside of the will of God? And the Greek word is always, I've already told you, just because the English translation says anger doesn't mean there are not multiple Greek words for anger. And there's one word for anger that is sudden to rise and sudden to dissipate. That means it, it, it happens quick and it leaves quick. And then there's another anger that happened like the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son. The younger brother leaves, insults the father, basically says, you're dead to me. The older brother stays behind. And then when the younger brother comes home, the older brother will not go into the house to celebrate with the father. It's because the anger that is described there is a different kind of anger. It's not sudden to rise, sudden to leave. It's like a pot of water that's been placed on a stove. And it begins to boil a little bit at a time. And then it begins to boil a lot. And an individual who stays on the burner just all of a sudden is described as he or she is just an angry person. You ever met somebody who was just an angry person? Not that they got mad from time to time. It's like they existed in the state of anger. That's when the devil has a major opportunity in the marriage. That's when the devil has a major opportunity in the relationship between uh, the, the father and the son and the mother and the daughter. And, and it even can divide families where grandparents are cut out of the lives of the grandchildren. The reality is this, the devil's only looking for a crack in the door. He doesn't need the door open all the way. Because like the slimy ooze that he is, he will make his way in your house if the door is open. That's why the idea behind this is this. Look, you can be angry. He's not saying don't be angry. He's saying in your anger, do not sin. And don't let the sun go down on your anger. I've known some individuals who believe the idea behind that was this. That means we can't go to bed tonight until we talk all about it and we come to a conclusion. You know what I've learned in life? Sometimes the more you talk, the more anger you get. And sometimes you can run into a dead end. And sometimes the best thing to do is like that man told me who'd been married over 50 years, sometimes you just need to go to the garage. I would say it this way. Sometimes there's a benefit to sleep on it. That passage doesn't mean don't go to bed uh, if you have a disagreement or you're, you're, you're feeling a certain way towards your spouse. That's not what that's... If that's what that says, then there should be a lot of sleepless nights in a lot of homes in the Lord's church. Because guess what? Anger occurs. What that is saying is this. Do not leave it unresolved. Do not pretend that it will just go away on its own. When I say it's okay to go to your corner or to sleep on it, what I am telling you is this. Sometimes, what is it said? Cooler heads prevail. And sometimes you just need to back away and take a breath. Because you've started arguing about everything except what made you crosswise with each other in the first place. He says, do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. It's... The devil's always looking for an opportunity into your life and mine. He can't wait to draw, drive a wedge between Aaron and I because if he knows he drives a wedge between Aaron and I, then it'll impact Colton, Michaela, Camden, and Bennett. And if he drives a wedge between Aaron and I, just by nature of the position that I am in, it will impact my preaching and it will impact my effectiveness. Don't think for one moment I am not aware that my personal life impacts my public life. 
And if you knew there was something amiss in my life and I was getting up preaching, it'd be very easy to just say, oh, we're not listening to him. He doesn't even know. That's why I regularly tell you I am in need of the grace of God. And I will offer this to you. I also know that Satan would love to drive a wedge between Aaron and I. And it doesn't matter how many times I miss the, the hamper with my sock. She is long suffering. Now, I will hear about it. Do not be mistaken. You will get to meet Aaron one day. I will hear about it. But you know what? The reality is this. She'll hear about it too when I wanted her to do something and maybe she did it a different way. That doesn't mean I'm going to for one minute let the devil come in and divide. Next, i got to keep going here. The, the screen tells you no unwholesome word. I don't want to bypass verse 28 that deals with stealing but I believe that in that concept that stealing is selfish. We must not practice selfishness within our homes. That's not a standard for a personal relationship that God says is sustaining and blessing. But this one comes up, verse 29, where it says this, verses 29 through 30, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I'm going to go ahead and tell you now, verse 30 could be unpacked and could really be a long Bible class in and of itself. So I'm not going to go into that, but what I do want you to know is verse 29 and 30 are not disconnected ideas. And so some individuals will look at verse 30 and they will talk about the Holy Spirit here as literally the third person of the Godhead. And then other people will look at this and they will say, well, this is the Spirit of God. And they will draw a distinction uh, based upon godly character. And they will say, you grieve godly character, the character of God, when you act in such a way that is not consistent with the character that He would have you to, to have. Another part of that is this. You actually grieve God because you told Him you were a Christian and you're not lining up with what you told Him. Now, you read the, the commentaries on that, and you're going to find arguments for all of those. One of the things I have learned through Bible study is just because my translator capitalized the word holy and the translator capitalized the word spirit doesn't mean the context still doesn't determine the meaning of the words. However, that aside, what I want you to know is this. Whatever is said in verse 29 impacts what is said in verse 30. So what's said in verse 29? He says this, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. You know that word unwholesome is a fancy word that means basically putrid. And in preaching school it was funny because you, you had these communication classes and they try to teach you things that you should not say from the pulpit, right? There are certain words that in communication you should not say because they would, they would come across painting a picture that you should not paint. Putrid, though, is one of those words that is best understood with an illustration. I don't know what the rule is in your home. The rule in my home is this, that if the garbage day is on Wednesday and we have meat that has gone bad and needs to go out to the garbage can, that meat does not leave the refrigerator until Wednesday morning. Here's why. When we were living in Florida, I went out and took the garbage to the side of the road and I noticed an awful, awful smell. Now in the state of Florida, it's about 7 in the morning, the humidity is already about 110% and it's already about 90 degrees or 95 degrees. To go walking in the morning, you have to cut the humidity in the state of Florida. But when I dragged that garbage can out and I noticed a smell, one of the things I should have never done is gone investigating. Have you ever seen those movies where you watch them and you're like, why would you go into that dark hallway? You know that's not good. Right? Well, when I drug that garbage can out to the side of the road and smelled the smell, I should have just let it go. But instead, I opened it up and investigated, thinking I was going to solve the smell. You know what I found? I found maggots crawling all inside of my garbage can. Have you ever opened your garbage can and seen a lot of little bitty white worms crawling all over the place? Have you ever smelled that? You can't forget that. Some of you want to kind of regurgitate just a little bit right now. Talking about that. 
Now here's the deal. Why do I not want the garbage out until Wednesday morning if it has meat in it? Because I don't want to smell maggots. The word unwholesome is the smell of the garbage can filled with maggots. That is as close of a word picture I can give you that the Greek language paints. The word unwholesome is just not, well, it's not culturally acceptable. Uh -uh. The word unwholesome there is putrid. It stinks. He says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. You don't understand, Joe. You don't understand what he said to me. And when he said what he said to me, that gave me permission to lash out with my words. Because nobody's going to talk to me that way. And I'll tell you what, I'll edify him all right. I'll edify her all right. I'll edify her and tell her all the time how she's doing it wrong. Or somebody may say this, yeah, that sounds good as long as you're getting along. It's easy to edify when she made your favorite meal. Or he picked up the vacuum cleaner and vacuumed. Oh, I'll affirm him and edify him. You know what's interesting about Christianity and being a disciple of Jesus is I don't get to choose when to do it and when not to do it. Because if I believe that's what I get to choose, then I am not the accurate disciple, the close disciple that God would have me to be. The idea of unwholesome words is even when they upset you, even when there are words that are said to you that hurt, at no point in time are you not accountable for the words that come out of your mouth. At no point in time is it okay to use certain words if somebody makes you mad. You see, that's the idea behind consistency and truly being transformed, the metamorphosis. The butterfly cannot live like the caterpillar anymore. And neither can the disciple of Jesus live like those who are not disciples and still be called a disciple. He says you can't keep doing that. Last but not least, he says this. When I look down at verse 30, uh, 31 and following, the Bible reads this way. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Now, when I say that we need to put away all malice, you need to understand that malice is a general term. It encompasses everything that you just read. The word malice literally means baseness or what is morally inferior and may thus be comprehensive, a comprehensive summary of the other five terms. So if that is the case, then what is bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander? Bitterness begins with resentment. Wrath is the burning anger that is hard to restrain. And anger is the exhibition of the inner wrath. It's the, the show of that. Clamor is loud yelling or outburst of words. And slander is blaspheming one's opponent. It's attacking. And what I would offer to you is this. When I see that list, you know what I see? I see a snowball that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I see those words that get crossed and maybe there's some resentment there, but you haven't voiced that resentment. So the anger just wells inside of you as the snowball gets bigger and bigger until finally it's just going to come out and then I'm going to speak against and then I'm going to attack. And to summarize all of that, the Bible says, put away moral baseness. Resentment is ugly. And when I go back and look at that, that's where this begins. And there are some, possibly even in this room or who are tuned in on Zoom, that you have harbored resentment against people in your families. Perhaps that's because they've really done you wrong. I've counseled with many people. Not, they've shared their story is the best way to say that. And some people who have shared their story are ladies who have said that their people in their life have really done wrong to them. Or sons who resented their father because their father never was proud of anything they did. And he was sure to tell them of all their faults, but never affirm them. 
And that resentment just welled up and welled up. And then all of a sudden what happens is that little girl that grew up into a grown woman that resented her father, it plays into the way that she deals with her husband. And the man who grew up resenting his father, perhaps it, it, it impacts the way that he deals with his wife when she's not quick to affirm or to uh, admire him. And then all of a sudden that resentment just plays out all over us again. There are some people who can be mad at this person, but take it out on that person. There are some individuals who can live life disappointed at this circumstance, but take it out on this circumstance. That's why I want you to hear me say this. The devil would love nothing more than you to leave here tonight continuing to harbor resentment against that person in your family. Some, some wives are harboring resentment against their husbands right now. And you've never told him that. And some husbands are harboring resentment against their wives. You say, Joe, why are you just dealing with resentment? I mean, there's wrath, anger, clamor, and slander. And here's why. Because if the first one is left unchecked, it will lead to the others. Amen. That cannot exist. That's why he ends with this positive. Verse 32. He says, look, it's not all about don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Standards for personal relationships are not all about the don'ts. Sometimes they are all about the do's as well. And he says this, verse 32. Be kind to one another. Tender hearted. Forgiving each other. Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. The kindness refers to being benevolent and doing what's beneficial to the one that you love. Tender hearted might be translated compassionate. It refers to rendering benefit to those who are in some kind of need. Forgiving suggests that we let go of the wrongs done to us and we do not demand punishment. Oh, I'll give him what he wants, but he's going to have to wait at least a month for that. Why? Because he made me mad. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll give her something for, for a gift or I'll, I'll take her on a date, but bye. She, she's not going to get that for the next two weeks. Why? Because I'm punishing her for what she said. You'd say, I cannot believe that people would ever say that to their spouse. But it happens. The reality is this. You have to make a choice tonight. And that choice is, do you want a family that is unified and a blessing? Or do you want a family that harbors resentment and is destructive? Now, I don't know all of your family situations. But I know this much. You cannot control the other person in your life. I cannot control Aaron and Aaron cannot control Joe. So here's the real question tonight. If I want... A marriage that's going to be a blessing to us, to my children, and to God. Then if I can't change Aaron, the only person I can work on is me. Tonight, the lesson is not so much going, man, Joe, you really hit him good. You really said the things he needs to know. Or from the husband's standpoint, well, I'm glad he addressed that because I can't address it at home. And when I do, it's just going to end up in an argument, right? So I'm glad my wife was here to hear that. Not you. Y'all are all perfect. Again, we don't deal with us. But here's what I know. If you think for one minute tonight's lesson is about you finger pointing to everybody else in your family, then you are the problem in your family. And none of that changes until you work on you. So tonight, I leave you with that. And I want you to know if there's something going on that you would like to talk about in private, because you can't talk about it in public, we, we'll make that time. I'll make that time. Kevin's here. He, he wants to make that time. Because we want your marriage, we want your family to be the blessing that God intends for it to be. Let's end with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, you have blessed us in ways that we cannot count, nor that we understand. You smile down upon us through the rainy seasons and in the sunshine. And Lord, in the times that we think that you're not there, we know that you are ever present. Our eyes have become blinded to our circumstances. Help us to see you through the clouds. Help us to see you through the storm. And help us to stay focused upon you as we too 
Strive to have a faith that will allow us to get out of the boat and walk in the storms of this life. Heavenly Father, I'm grateful for these families. I love these families. I know you love these families. And I pray that your word will benefit all of us tonight as we make personal application. And I pray that our marriages will be honoring and glorifying to you. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.